though she never got my joke, she knew when I was being funny. Had an admiration for the kind of thing that she did. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys coming. I've had a weird couple of weeks. I recently had to deliver my grandfather's eulogy rebuttal. <laughs> So this is a layup compared to that. Uh, I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. Uh, when I was a little kid, my neighbor and I designed and built our own parachutes. And in order to test them, we jumped off the roof of my house. I broke my leg. My neighbor broke both of his proving mine to be the superior design. <laughs> I believe on the strength of my parachute experiment, one summer, my parents sent me to science camp. It's about as fun as it sounds. It's science camp, so you're not allowed to believe in things like ghosts. We told low probability event stories around the campfire. <laughs> Growing up, we had a panic room in our house. It was whichever room my mother was in. <laughs> I don't think I did very much to ease my poor mother's anxieties. One morning, in an effort to get out of going to school, I pretended to be possessed by the devil. <laughs> she was trying to get me dressed. I was screaming at her in Latin. <laughs> it didn't take her long to figure out that the real devil probably wouldn't just keep yelling e pluribus unum over and over again. <laughs> that was not easy to deal with. For most of my childhood, I thought my parents were actually trying to get me kidnapped. <laughs> Our stranger safe word was candy. <laughs> That's better. I was born uh, by a cesarean section, which I realized one day means that if I should ever get the death penalty, I will have come into and gone out of this life by appointment. <laughs> I have, uh, I've heard it said that the, uh, both the happiest and saddest day in a man's life is the first time he beats his father at something. And when I was 16, for the first time, I beat my father at golf. And we were walking off the 18th green, and we got hit with this weird feeling. Like, he was looking at me with pride, like I was becoming a man. But at the same time, he was feeling an eerie sense of his own mortality. And I got hit with a really normal but awful guilt for having cheated. <laughs> We were idiotically competitive, my father and I. When I was a little kid, he would try to one-up me at things. And now he's an old man, and I'm still trying to one-up him. <laughs> it hit its crescendo about a year ago when I had a vacation coming, and I decided to go to Vietnam, just so he can't throw that in my face anymore. <laughs> Technically, he, he still, um, he killed more people. <laughs> he was a medic. He didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> he was also, uh, he was terrible at explaining things to children. 
I don't know if anyone had a father like that. <laughs> it was almost like he had never been one. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I, I was terrified of the dark. And one day, my father had enough of it. And he sat me down and he explained that there's no reason to be afraid of the dark. Because in the dark, you can't see who's there. <laughs> But, and he leaned in for this bit of wisdom. <laughs> he said, whoever's there can't see you. <laughs> yeah, because the level playing field is what upsets a child <laughs> about the dark. I wish I could have responded to my father <laughs> at seven years old in the same tone <laughs> that he was talking to me like, Dad, I've been looking at the dark the wrong way. <laughs> what I've been experiencing as a primal fear is actually an opportunity <laughs> for a battle of wits around my bedroom <laughs> against the boogeyman who you seem to be suggesting very well might be there. <laughs> but he's dealing with the same set of disadvantages as I am. <laughs> I complain uh, about my upbringing a lot, but I try, um, I try my best to um, acknowledge my, uh, my privilege, as people like me are encouraged to do. Um, <laughs> And I try, but it isn't always easy if you, if you examine some of the details of my life. Um, you, you know how people from certain like, disadvantaged groups will sometimes say things like, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. Well, I'm the first person in my family who doesn't believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> And I assure you, that is deeper than race or gender or sexual identity, whatever it is, and rightly so. Cryptozoology is a special category of stupidity. It's not, it's not, like, it's not like UFOs or God, it, it's... Those are in some ways unfalsifiable. It's a different kind of belief than believing that a monster lives in a lock even after we check the lock. That's a different way of thinking. Those are, those are entirely different beliefs. Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, the Florida Skunk Ape, that's one of them. The Florida Skunk Ape, who by the way, is also known as Swamp Cabbage Man. I mean, this stuff is obviously just what happens when you teach idiots words. <laughs> the average moron knows over 10,000 words. You allow enough time to pass, one of them's gonna blurt out Swamp Cabbage Man eventually. They'll get around to all of it. <laughs> you really can't. You can get humans to believe practically anything. Uh, I had a, a great aunt and a great uncle, and uh, they were married for 70 years. And when she died, he ended up dying very soon after. And his cause of death according to everyone in my family, a few of whom are doctors, uh, was that without her, he just didn't want to go on living anymore. Funerals aren't the best place to start poking holes in people's coping <laughs> strategies. I appreciate this. But no one in my family would even entertain the possibility that coincidence was involved here. 
These people were in their 90s. I don't want to cast a shadow on anybody's notion of the power of true love, but the fact is, you could pull random 90-year-olds off the street and pair them up before long, two would die within a couple months of each other. It's just probability after a certain age. It was a far greater statistical oddity that they both made it to 95 than it was that neither made it to 96. I just found out that the uh, girl that I used to date in high school has decided to become a nun. And I've never heard that about anybody. So uh, when I saw her, I, I asked her about it, and she said that that isn't her path anymore because now she's married to Jesus, which is creepy. <laughs> With the age difference. What could they have in common? <laughs> when she was in kindergarten, he was 1980. <laughs> I'm not really proud of this fact, but uh, whenever I drive past a cow, I moo. <laughs> and I can't really imagine a time in my life when I wouldn't moo. If I just found out my wife was having an affair, and in a fit of rage, I got in the car to go kill her and her lover, and on the way, I passed a cow. I might not moo, but on the way back, I don't, really, I don't really believe in hell, but I, I think uh, if I had a personal hell, like my, my own personal hell, I, I always thought would be a, um, a never-ending staircase and a woman with a baby stroller <laughs> struggling to get up it so that I would have to spend eternity pretending not to notice her. <laughs> I made one of the classic social miscues the other day. I referred to a woman who pronounces her name Anna as Jennifer. And I feel bad when I make fun of Anna's because my name is James, and that James is also one of those names that people are always trying to alter or shorten for you. And I, because of that, when I was a kid in school, I think I, I had an added layer of sympathy for Jim from Huckleberry Finn. I used to think, like, hey, maybe he doesn't want to be called any of that. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm alone in my apartment, I conduct what I call blind practice. And uh, what I do is I, I blindfold myself, and then I see if I know my apartment well enough to hang myself. Because <laughs> they don't train the dogs for that. Uh, <clears throat> I was reading a book recently uh, about the sort of um, allegations against um, Michael Jackson. And uh, it, it's everything you know, but it turns one thing I didn't know that it turns out that uh, in Michael Jackson's house, he had a uh, he had a secret room. And as a general rule, I don't care for pedophiles, <laughs> but I love secret rooms. <laughs> <laughs> to the point, I kind of decided that I, I think I'm going to have a secret room in my house someday, and I'm gonna fill it with weird, perverted things 
that just never quite reached the level of illegal. <laughs> like, so when the cops raid my secret room, they're gonna find pornography and sex toys, and on the back there's gonna be a shrine full of pictures of a little boy, but the little boy's gonna be me. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, officers. I win again. <laughs> the, uh, the you say tomato, I say tomato song continues to give people the wrong idea about how language works. <laughs> that song suggests this very uh, laissez-faire attitude <laughs> that is untrue 99% of the time in language. Tomato, tomato, and potato, potato are rare instances of wiggle room <laughs> in pronunciation, but let uneducated people get their hands on this premise. They want to apply it to every grammatical mistake they make, every word they mispronounce. They're looking at you like you're crazy. They're like, what, you say toilet? I say turlet. And you say, no, turlet's not a word. You can't say turlet. <laughs> and they say, well, what about tomato and tomato? And you say, well, you see, the problem is that you're poor. <laughs> so, so you don't understand a range of things. <laughs> And then it becomes class warfare. I mean, why even get involved in this discussion? That song should just go, you say tomato, and that's how you say it. <laughs> I don't like it much when men um, use the scale of one to 10 to rate women physically. It's just an awful, mean-spirited thing to do. Uh, which is why, in the interest of sparing people's feelings, I only use eight, nine, and 10 <laughs> for my scale. <laughs> because it makes people feel better to hear that they're an eight, even though they don't know. <laughs> On my scale, eight is ugly, nine is average, 10 is attractive, which is all you really need. The, the one to 10 hotness scale is negative just by virtue of its own structure. <laughs> Men typically only use seven, eight, nine, and 10 to describe women they think are attractive. So there are only four different levels to differentiate categories of hot women. But for some reason, six levels <laughs> to more accurately sift through the rubble. They, <laughs> they call it a hotness scale, but its focus is actually the other way. <laughs> Simple semantics brings us to the problem here. If you're gonna have a hotness scale, women who aren't hot shouldn't be on it. <laughs> if you were rating great athletes, you wouldn't start with Stephen Hawking and work your way up. <laughs> start at the top, work your way down, and then choose a reasonable place to stop <laughs> where athletes end and non-athletes begin. Ones and twos should be the lowest level of hot person and the rest of us should be spared the humiliation of the scale. I realize this takes some of the fun out of those conversations. <laughs> oh, what'd she look like? Oh, man, she was a good, solid, not applicable. Uh, I'm gonna read something for you guys. Uh, uh, give yourselves a round of applause so I'm comfortable. <laughs> So uh, many years ago, when I was starting out doing stand-up, I, um, I wrote Bill Gates a letter uh, asking him if he would pay my rent from now on. And, um, and then after I wrote it, I kind of realized that I should just write every billionaire a letter asking them if they'll pay my rent from now on. So I wrote, this is the first letter I wrote. I wrote this one to Bill Gates, but then after that, I kind of, I, I just wrote a sort of general letter in mass email. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll, just, I'll just read it. Um, all right. Dear Mr. Gates, I was wondering if it would be within your means to pay my rent from now on. Based on what I have read financially, you are in a position to do this. I am an aspiring writer and comedian, and my financial situation is, in a word, ludicrous. 
My rent generally goes unpaid, and I seldom eat food. <laughs> the patronage system of 17th and 18th century Europe has all but vanished, leaving young artists to fend for themselves. As I'm sure you're aware, most of the classical masters, from da Vinci to Beethoven, were supported by wealthy patrons. Not to put myself in their class, of course, but then again, who knows? <laughs> Maybe if I spent more time writing and less time ducking my landlord, I could get to work on a masterpiece of my own. I cannot claim to be familiar with the industry in which you have found such monumental success. From what I gather, you are something of an inventor, a man skilled with devices and gadgets. Yours is a noble calling. I, on the other hand, am not an overly mechanical man. I am profoundly confused by magnets. <laughs> Any concept more complex than magnetism pushes me to the brink of seizures. My skills lie elsewhere, on the page. But are we not both creators? What is the occasion for man if not to lift up his brothers and sisters to fulfill their creative potential? My rent is $7.75 a month. <laughs> That doesn't include utilities, but my father already said that if I get you to pay my rent, he'll take care of the utilities, so you needn't be concerned with that. Although my father is in advancing years, so if anything unfortunate were to happen to him, I'm afraid I would need you to send an additional $125 for the gas bill on my phone. But we will, as they say, cross that bridge as we get to it. I hope I haven't monopolized too much of your time in the way you are, you are rumored to have monopolized much of the gadget industry. I hope to hear from you in the form of well wishes and checks. <laughs> Sincerely, James Patterson. So, so like I said, I wrote that and then I just, I just sent out like 40 of them and I never thought about them again. And a couple, like a month later, uh, I got a, an email from the office of, uh, I'm, I'll change the name, like Pete Smith. He's an oil billionaire. <laughs> In, uh, in Texas. And it wasn't from him, but it, it was from it, it, like his administrative assistant. So uh, this, this is the email uh, that I got in response. Uh, Dear Mr. Patterson, from the tone of your letter, it's difficult to tell whether your request is sincere or an attempted joke. <laughs> Mr. Smith has many charitable organizations he works closely with. And here she included a lot of information about UNICEF. Uh, <laughs> these organizations help people who are in actual need. <laughs> Please refrain from contacting this office again, <laughs> as your letters will not be taken seriously. Sincerely, Maure Maureen Reynolds. So I just immediately wrote another letter. <laughs> Dear Miss Reynolds, while I was not thrilled with the tone of your letter, <laughs> I do appreciate you getting back to me. None of the other billionaires did. <laughs> But regarding your implication that I am not in actual need, I must protest. I am in very bad shape. East Africa famine bad shape? If I may, a bit worse. <laughs> if you think about it, the East Africans are used to it. It's never been any good over there. My pressures are different and could actually be solved by financial assistance. Mr. Smith could send every penny he's ever made to East Africa, and it would continue to be a terrible place to be. <laughs> please, Miss, Miss, please, Miss Reynolds, with respect to his paying my rent from now on, I beg you, ask him again. <laughs> All right, so, uh... Back to the right. Well, I, I lived in this neighborhood years ago, and uh, I'm back for the first time, and I was walking to the theater the other night, and for a split second, I thought I saw my ex-girlfriend on the street. And, but when I got a little closer, it turned out to be a homeless guy. <laughs> 
I haven't thought of a joke about it yet. <laughs> I just can't wait to tell her. <laughs> I, as when I, I was living here, uh, I think it was, it was about 14 years ago, uh, on the first day of the second war in Iraq. And on that same day, I purchased my very first fish tank. Pure historical coincidence. Uh, but it really, did, um, it really did change the way I looked at that war. I, I, would never, I, I don't mean to say that it, it made me sympathize with Saddam Hussein, but it did teach me the invaluable lesson in life that it's hard to be in charge of things. <laughs> you know, he had competing Shiite and Sunni interests, the Kurds in the North, international sanctions, and I want to be clear, I'm not talking about a fish bowl. <laughs> Tank. Pumps, filters, chemicals, things that require leadership. And, and the way you, and when you have a fish tank, you, the way you start kind of sympathizing with dictators is, I know in my heart, I was doing what I thought was best for those fish. <laughs> but from their point of view, I'm the worst mass murderer that's ever lived. Hussein was Gandhi compared to the bloodbath. <laughs> Do you guys like uh, divisive political comedy that divides the audience and makes everybody uncomfortable? Is that, do you like that? Mm. Mm, good. Because I, I, don't, I don't only have jokes that work. I, I got plenty of the other kind too. Uh, uh, I guess we'll wade right in. Are you guys familiar uh, with the, the phenomenon of um, uh, police officers shooting innocent people for no apparent reason. Have you guys met you? Yes, miss, I know, but let me get the whites up to speed. Uh, it, they're shooting them. Uh, it's been going on for a while. Uh, so one thing I, I've noticed, whenever somebody's defending uh, the cops when, when, in these cases, um, they always trot out the same argument. They always say that the cop has a right to get home safe to his family, which sounds right. <laughs> but I realized one day, you never really hear that same line of reasoning applied to firefighters. Like for some reason, the fire department, a fireman can't just race up to a burning building and say, you know what, guys? My wife's making tacos tonight. Uh, I <laughs> I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna get home safe to my family tonight. You know, if she were making meatloaf, I'd run right in there with you. You guys know me. Like, if you're a cop or a firefighter, courage and self-sacrifice, they're not just nice things to have. They're the whole job. That's the entire job. That's what you're paid to do. Like, in the old days, a captain would go down with a sinking ship for no reason. <laughs> Today, a cop will shoot a six-year-old, and his legal defense was that he got nervous. <laughs> well, maybe this isn't the right line of work for you. <laughs> I, I, you might not be the right man for this job, and I'm not suggesting for a second that I would be the right man for that job. I would be shooting at bees, but... <laughs> if, that's why I didn't choose protect and serve. <laughs> Religious violence is the other one, seemingly ineradicable story, just that pops up constantly. And it's the same thing, you know, it's, it's complicated. I, I don't pretend to have a solution, but I, I, um, I do know one thing. I think if we had to choose a group of people to turn into crazed suicide bombers who wanted to kill as many people as they could. I don't think we could do much better than picking religious people. 
like, just imagine how much worse our situation could be if we were up against a different group with a different skill set. I'll start with the worst case scenario. Imagine if scientists decided to form a death cult <laughs> and wanted to kill as many people as they could. <laughs> that would be a whole different level of emergency. <laughs> like, we would... You give one evolutionary epidemiologist 10 minutes at the Center for Disease Control, he could wipe out cities like Godzilla, just like pestilence and plague and a Tic Tac. Like, just, like. And that's teachers, that's worst case. But I, there are tons of groups that I would be more afraid of. What if we had to just, what if we were up against just regular teachers? Like, what if teachers went nuts? They already think they should have summers off, that's kind of crazy, like what? <laughs> What if they said one day, you know what, spring too. If it's nice out, we're not working. I would be more afraid of them. Do you understand, like, you see what happens to these terror groups? Like, ISIS has been relegated to weaponizing rental cars <laughs> because they can't outsmart the TSA anymore. The TSA, that crack security unit, not paying attention at the airport. They made the terrorists take off their shoes and the terrorist response was to call Enterprise. They're like, looks like we're driving, guys. We got it. You think about it. On the terrorist's best day, September 11th, 2001, this is their banner achievement. But if you actually look at the statistics for that day, just through sheer incompetence, they left so many infidels on the table. Like they, <laughs> want any attention to detail at all. And that death toll spikes, like just off the trip. I know it's horrible to say, but if something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Look, if, <laughs> how about for starters, don't, there were 40,000 people in those buildings when the planes hit them. 38,000 of them just walked down the stairs and left. <laughs> Maybe you don't fly the planes into the tops of the buildings. You're already up there. You might as well crash the planes where they're... That's bad, but that's not even close to as bad as what happened here. We're in Boston. I'm sure many of the people in this room have been down to the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Those two simpletons <laughs> walked into one of the most crowded places on earth and killed three people with a bomb. <laughs> they could have killed more than that with shellfish. <laughs> this is not comedic exaggeration. It would have been more effective terrorism to have showed up with a food truck and just wait for customers to say, excuse me, does this have shellfish in it? And go, nah, you're good. No, there's more, <laughs> there's more. You understand. They're trying to kill as many people as they can. But they're religious halfwits, so they're no good at it. And, I, and it's always on my mind because I just know I would be so good at it. Like, I, I, I don't even like thinking about how good at it I would be. The whiskey's almost gone. This is where I start making radical claims. I have always believed that if I weren't afraid to die and I wanted to kill as many people as I could, I could kill one person for every dollar in my budget. <laughs> now, full disclosure, I use my father's contractor's discount at the Home Depot. 15% <laughs> margin of error, but I'm pretty sure even at retail prices, 
I could kill you for four quarters. That, it, <laughs> you have no idea how cheap unstable chemicals are at the Home Depot. This could be done very easily. That's, that, that's a dollar though. If I had oil money behind me, <laughs> like these idiots do, you give me fifteen. You give me fifty thousand dollars. Nobody leaves Fenway Park alive. <laughs> Not a vendor. I'll get everybody. I never know what joke to tell after that one. Uh, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna tell a story. Uh, I, um, I don't know if you guys ever had the experience of this. Uh, I, I recently, I, I, had a, um, I had a crazy doctor. Uh, it was uh, really disconcerting. I, I, I don't have a doctor, I don't have a regular physician. You know, I, I just go where the poor people go <laughs> and hope someone there speaks enough English for me to be able to explain what's wrong with me. And, I, <laughs> and it's, a, it's, it's a weird, you know, I, I went and I got a physical from one doctor and then I got the results from a different doctor. <laughs> and the Republicans think this is too good a system. That, like that's, <laughs> they need something with a lot more holes in it than that <laughs> for me. Uh, but, so, <laughs> I'm getting the results from the physical from this doctor, and um, I should tell you that based on how I live, when, I, when I'm getting the results of a physical, uh, I'm listening for liver function, <laughs> number one, STDs, number two, and there is no number three. Those are the, those are the only things that I, I'm, I'm afraid of and that's what I'm thinking of. I don't even know how many digits your cholesterol has. Like I don't even, I, I, it's all white noise. I'm just lasered in on those things. So I'm sitting across from this doctor and she's going through my chart and she had a weird accent. I don't know where she was from, but um, I'll try to approximate it. She's going through the chart and she's like, you know, thyroid good, this is good, this is good, good. And then she stops suddenly and she goes, uh, may I ask one question? Do you drink? And as soon as she said drink, I was like, lay it on me. Here it comes. <laughs> like, I, I know where this is going. Uh, but it wasn't about that. She, uh, she said, I will ask one question. Uh, do you drink the tap water? I, I said, I have drank tap water. <laughs> and she said, this is very bad. Because in the tap water, there is the fluoride. <laughs> and the fluoride is a poison. And this woman went on to talk about fluoride <laughs> for 20 minutes. Did that she, I never saw a doctor do this. She took out her phone and opened up her pictures and started showing me memes from obvious conspiracy theorist websites. <laughs> one after another, she had hundreds of them. Nothing scientific, just fluoride is poison in one font, fluoride is poison in a different font. <laughs> just went through them one after another and I am writhing in my seat. I'm looking ahead on the chart, trying to see the HIV with the negative, but that's not how they write it. I, did, I couldn't, I had no idea and uh, so I, I, she gets done, I'm like, doctor, I'll never drink tap water again. She says, okay, so she puts her glasses back up, she goes back to the chart, and she, uh, she starts going through the stuff again, thyroid is good, this is good, good. And then she stops again, lowers her glasses again. And she says, I can ask one question. She says, do you ever use the toothpaste? And she said it as though I would have no idea where this might be headed. I, 
And I am so deferential to doctors. I never talk back to them. I never say anything. But I, and I, I lost my mind. I was like, I, miss, I don't even know what toothpaste is. <laughs> I've never heard of it. And she said, that is very good because in the toothpaste there is the fluoride and the fluoride is a poison. And she talked about toothpaste for another 15 minutes. New information, left examples of how fluoride is poison out of the tap water talk because she knew she was gonna get to it in the toothpaste talk. By the way, while all of this is going on, there is a waiting room packed with poor people. Just little kids with eye patches. It went like, and I lost my mind. And I was, like, I was like, doctor, I have to stop you. I don't want to be rude. I was like, but I, I think I should tell you a quick story about how I live. But about a month ago, I decided I had better go get a physical. Because the night before, I went home with a woman after drinking 15 glasses of whiskey which according to the chart out in your lobby, falls squarely in the much too much range. <laughs> and after this woman were, and I were in her apartment in the throes of hanging out, <laughs> she looked at me and said, oh, don't worry, you don't have to use a condom because I am 100% clean. And then she added, but to be honest, I have no idea how. <laughs> and on the strength of that account, I didn't use a condom. <laughs> I don't have to be a doctor to tell you, fluoride is not gonna be what kills me. <laughs> but I might be what kills you if you don't tell me about herpes right now. <laughs> Um, I got in a pretty big argument with my girlfriend before I left the apartment today. Uh, she said that uh, my problem in life is that I never make plans. Little does she know, Operation New Girlfriend has been underway for months. <laughs> I don't really have a girlfriend, but uh, <laughs> we broke up. Uh, we, we had been together for a really long time, and it's, um, it's a huge mental adjustment when you've been part of a couple for so many years. So you just get so used to thinking in terms like, you're, you're so used to thinking in terms of murder-suicide. <laughs> that to suddenly one day be left alone with just the suicide. You really find yourself missing the murder. <laughs> I'm told that I, I talk about uh, suicide more than you're supposed to. <laughs> which is at all. Uh, that seems a bit strenuous to me. Uh, I would never do it. I, I would never kill myself. But I, I do think if, uh, if there were something available to humans just, just one notch less severe than suicide, I would do that thing every week. I, I don't want to die, but if I could commit two-week coma, I might never make it through another conversation. Like, did you hear James two-week coma himself? What happened? He said his apartment was too hot. I never cheat on girlfriends. That's another... You'd think that would be worth more <laughs> than it is, but I, I don't. It is, I, I, I was talking to an old girlfriend once, we were having kind of a relationship talk, and I told her that the only thing that bothers me in a relationship is cheating. And she said, well, what do you consider cheating to be? And I said, well, roughly speaking, asking that question. <laughs> I never have. I've never cheated on a girlfriend. And I, I think uh, 
It's not because I'm a good person. I, I think the main reason for that is because I, I personally never experience enough, as much pleasure from sex as I do from playing the role of moral superior. <laughs> she can have the sex as long as I get to make the condescending speeches. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have expected as much. Involving myself with a person like you. For me, sex is never as good as that tone. That, that is sex. I have a cape that I wear. <laughs> a little fan I set up for a dramatic flutter <laughs> as I lecture. <laughs> I'm going on a lot of horrible first dates now that I've been single for a while. And it's, uh, the other night I was out with this woman and we were in this kind of like noisy, hip sort of restaurant. And it was going fine. But um, when the waiter came and put our food down in front of us, my date looked down at her plate and for about 40 solid seconds, she prayed <laughs> over her meal. And I'm not religious, but I think as long as you're a good looking woman. You can do wacky things <laughs> in restaurants. It didn't throw me off that she prayed so much as it did that she prayed over the main course <laughs> after not having prayed over the appetizer. <laughs> These are the things religious people do that I find interesting. I don't care what you think, but how you think is fascinating. <laughs> this woman dove into the chips and guacamole as though Darwinian selection were the only explanation that she required. <laughs> 10 minutes later, fish tacos brought her to her knees. I want to know why. <laughs> I'm just bad, I'm bad at, bad at picking them, I guess. You know, I, there's a trick in engineering that's called the majority rule. And the way it works, a simple example is that sailors in the old days, they used to bring three of each instrument with them out to sea. And the idea was if you had one compass and it went haywire, you would have no way of knowing. If you had two compasses and one broke, you wouldn't know which one was right and which one was wrong. But if you had three compasses, you could be pretty sure that the two that are in agreement are correct. And I think that concept is the best argument I've ever heard in favor of polygamy. <laughs> If you only have one, it's hard to tell when there's something wrong with it. In my last relationship, if I had two other girlfriends who didn't cry every time they got a haircut, I might have known right away which one was broken. One thing I... I've discovered during this period, for some reason, where I've been single for a while, is that women, for some reason, find me to be an extremely unthreatening guy. I don't know if I like it. <laughs> I live in a basement apartment. And in order to get down to it, you have to take a dirty cement staircase. <laughs> and there's just one flickering neon light <laughs> in the ceiling. And the door to the actual apartment is metal and rusted. <laughs> and women I just met follow me down there. <laughs> <laughs> like they met me in a nursery rhyme. And the other night I was going home with this woman and I know I shouldn't have said anything, <laughs> but I was just about to unlatch this giant dungeon door. <laughs> and I looked at her and I was like, hey, are you even considering where I might be taking you right now? <laughs> and she said, oh my God. <laughs> you don't have cats, do you? I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna read one more thing. Uh, um, um, all right, so... Um, this is, uh, this is another thing I wasted a lot of time on. Um, as a comedian, you, you end up getting, um, getting asked, you get asked to do a lot of gigs that have absolutely nothing to do with comedy. And uh, 
The most irritating version I had to deal with recently was uh, a guy got in touch with me and he asked me if I wanted to be the judge of a wet t-shirt contest. <laughs> and uh, there was no way I was going to do it, but I wanted to be a dick about it. <laughs> um, so, because the guy came off, he was, he, was just, he was the kind of guy that runs a wet t-shirt contest. So, uh, <laughs> so um, this, was a, this is an email exchange between me and wet t-shirt contest promoter and likely date rapist. Mark. Mark. Yes, I am extremely interested in the gig. But other things I'm also extremely interested in are fairness and the spirit of competition. When I was starting out in comedy, I was asked to judge a pie eating contest as a part of the Bear Mountain Blueberry and Comedy Festival. The rules of the competition and criteria by which I was to cast my judgment were either poorly explained or not explained at all. <laughs> I crowned a winner based on her having eaten the most pies. This seemed a reasonable course to me. The runner-up disagreed, however, by way of attacking me physically. <laughs> His position, if it could be called that, was that he had eaten more pie out of each of the pies. And the winner had cheated by simply shoving her face in the pie and then flinging the tin away. What difference does it really make you fat simpleton didn't seem like the prudent thing for me to say at the time. <laughs> so I changed my vote, thereby starting a small riot. <laughs> I would love to judge your wet t-shirt contest, but I'm going to have to ask for some very specific instructions as to what you're looking for in a winner. Sorry to be a pain about this, but if you've never heard, the Bear if you've never heard of the Bear Mountain Blueberry and Comedy Festival, it's because that was the last one. <laughs> Fill me in on the details, and I'll be there. Uh, so I wrote that expecting just no response. But six minutes later, <laughs> Mark responds, oh man, that sounds crazy. This isn't really a serious competition, though. <laughs> we pretty much just want you guys to comment on the contestants, kind of roast them and the ref. You know, stuff like that. And then this next line sort of made me start to like Mark. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter who wins, and all the contestants know that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark. <laughs> and that amused me. But I was already joke committed at this point, so I plunged ahead. <laughs> hey, Mark, for some reason I was unable to open your last email. I'll just jump right into the meat of the problem as I see it. <laughs> well, what I'm most concerned with is what I hope you'll allow me to call the absorption variable. <laughs> is a t-shirt that is as, wet it's, is as wet as it's capable of being more or less wet than a t-shirt that is as wet as it's capable of being? <laughs> To my mind, the answer is plainly no. I see saturation, and I think the last 200 years of science backs me up here as an absolute state. <laughs> a shirt unable to take in any more moisture is as wet as any other shirt that is unable to take in any more moisture. <laughs> if a wet t-shirt contest purports to measure the amount of water present, then clearly a more absorbent shirt holds an advantage. But that standard is never made clear. <laughs> My question for you is this, Mark. Are you willing to make that standard clear? <laughs> I really think we're onto something here. Talk to you soon, James. So I wrote that at four in the morning. And, uh, and I, Mark, I, I guess he woke up the next morning. I, I, think he, I think he kind of figured out what was going on. So uh, he, he just wrote back, hey, James, you know what, man? Thanks anyway, but we already found someone for the gig. I'll keep you in mind for things I have down the road. Thanks again, Mark. So I concluded, uh, hey, Mark, my cat jumped on my laptop and accidentally deleted your last email. <laughs> I 
I've gone ahead and cleared my schedule for the night of Wednesday the 12th. Because I feel that generally speaking, we're on the same page here. We just have to iron out a few more of the epistemological and ontological problems and then figure out who's gonna pick me up to bring me to the gig. <laughs> As to the philosophical questions, I'm working on a full-length paper in a Word file. There are images, so I'll send it over as an attachment. I'm not sure how familiar you are with standard notation and formal logic, but there's a fair amount of it. So uh, as to my ride, I don't mind if you hire a car or just send a friend to pick me up, as long as whoever it is is told not to honk the horn outside my house. M my cat sleeps Wednesdays. <laughs> Thanks again for the gig. Really looking forward to helping you crown the most deserving wet t-shirt contest winner. See you then. So then just very, very quickly, I, 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 have, um, I have the email that I'm going to send on the 12th. <laughs> Just very good. Just, Mark, I said no honking outside my house. My cat's wide awake and as angry as I've ever seen him. I'm getting in a cab. I'm bringing the cat. Be outside. Guys, thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.